Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, my, it's good to see everybody in today, and uh, for those of you joining us on television, uh, remember this is just program one now of the next series of four, and then we'll complete book number 73, and you multiply that times 12, and that's the number of programs we've produced. And uh, one of these days we should be able to wrap it up <laughs> and call it quits. But so far, no, we're going to keep going. So anyway, again, we'd like to welcome you to an informal Bible study. And, you know, i got to compliment you folks here in the studio. When we review these and look at them, you know, I come back to what someone said years ago. He says, Les, do you realize that everybody that sits under your teaching has their own Bible? And I'd never really thought of it that before. And so when we watch the film, sure enough, everybody's got their own Bible. And so I do. I appreciate that so much for those of you here in the studio because we know our TV audience is doing the same thing. They grab their Bible and uh, they sit down and watch it with us. Okay, now I only have one announcement and we're still going to let folks know that our one and only book of questions and answers is still available and uh, we send it out with uh, no other charge except for the 11 bucks for the book itself. And uh, if you're interested, you just call and the girls will get it out to you. We uh, send everything out with an invoice. And for those of you out in television, you pay for it when you get it. All right, we're going to continue on on our series that uh, we started in our last four programs on the incarnate Christ, which is a coin term merely to define that Jesus of Nazareth was totally God and totally man. You know, that's a concept that a lot of believers, I think, even have a hard time recognizing that when he prayed to the Father, he prayed from his humanity. He was totally human. He got tired. He got weary. And uh, there were times when... Uh, he just simply showed his humanity. He wept. When Lazarus died, the, the sorrow of that household touched him like it would any human being. But on the other hand, he was totally God. And he could raise the dead. He could forgive sin. And I was thinking again last night. We, we, we hear these things and we believe them. But do you really sit back and Picture it if you'd have been there with those 12 on the Sea of Galilee and the waves are beating over that little boat and the wind is roaring and all he does is stands up and says, Peace, be still, and whoosh, everything's quiet. Now we know the story, but do you really stop and think what that must have been like? No wonder the 12 says, What kind of a man is this? He's God, the same one who created everything. Never lose that. I think if anything has thrilled me in this series of lessons now on the incarnation is that it just brings home to me once again that had God not become flesh, we'd have never had salvation. Do you know that? We'd have been doomed automatically. And then at the same time, they came up with another thought. Now, we know that the Old Testament, especially, let's go back and look at it. I didn't really intend to do this. I may even have to look and see if I can find it. I think it's Deuteronomy chapter 6. I hope it is, or I'm in trouble. <coughs> yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. See, and this is the premise of most of the Jews thinking even today. And that's why an Orthodox Jew cannot swallow the New Testament because they call our concept of a triune God polytheism. Well, you're worshiping more than one God. And we don't. All right, here's their reasoning. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is what? One Lord. See, and they can't get away from that. 
But now, have you ever stopped to analyze this whole idea of a triune God? Now, you can go back to Philippians again. Be ready for when we get on the point. Have you ever stopped to think, again, could God have precipitated our great plan of salvation if there had been only one person of the Godhead? Have you ever thought about that? What if there had only been one person of the Godhead? Let's just say God the Father. Could he have consummated this glorious plan of salvation? Well, he could have gone part way, but what would he have done when he was ready to die and we would have to be resurrected? Who would do it? See? It falls over. But to see, with the concept of a triune God, one of them could come down and become flesh, become flesh and blood. He could die. He could safely go through death and the tomb because you still had two persons of the Godhead to call him forth. And they did. So you see, the more you analyze all this, the more miraculous it becomes, and yet the most logical of anything on earth. And so keep all these things in mind and, uh, and mull them over. Mind your spare time. Just think these things over and over. What if there had only been one person of the Godhead? What if one of them hadn't come down and become flesh and blood? And so it is thought-provoking. Okay, so here we go for another series of teaching on the incarnate Christ, the God-man. Philippians chapter 2, and we'll drop in at verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, where Paul writes, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, my next series, whether I'll start this afternoon yet, I think I will, is going to be on the Holy Spirit. And I maintain that the Holy Spirit is a person. The same as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Some people say he isn't. In fact, sometimes I wonder if our translators didn't feel that he wasn't a person because how many times don't you see the Spirit referred to as it and which? And don't you often wonder, well, why not a personal pronoun? Well, see, some people don't agree that he's a person. But what made me think of it? What are the three parts that make up a person? Now, you've been with me long enough. What is it? Mind, will, and emotion. That makes a personality. All right, what made me think of it? What word have we got right here? Mind. See? Paul says, let this mind, this part of your makeup, be in you, which was also in whom? In Christ. He's a person. He's mind, will, emotion. He's a personality. God the Father is mind, will, emotion. God the Spirit, and I'm going to show that. Mind, will, emotion. All right, so let this part of the very personality of Christ be also in you, and the only way that can happen is by virtue of being born from above, and we become part of all that. All right, now verse 6. Who, speaking of God the Son, being in the form of God, he was God from eternity past. Now, some of the cults teach, of course, that Christ didn't appear until many, 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 many ages after the fact, that he was not eternal in his existence. But this says he was. He's always been God from eternity past. All right, so who also being in the form of God thought it not robbery or something that he could just grasp because he wanted it, to be equal with God because he was. It wasn't something that he had to grab for. He had it. All right, now verse 7. But what did he himself do? He made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of not an emperor, not a prince, not a governor, not a dictator, not a senator, not a physicist, not anything else, but a what? What's the other word for servant in the New, in the New Testament? Huh? Bond slave. 
the bond slave. Well, on the totem pole of society, where was a bond slave? At the bottom. Wasn't he? Yeah. So Christ became flesh, not like these televangelists try to tell us, that he was rich and he had all these world's goods. I say, hey, that's not what my Bible says. My Bible said that he was comparing himself to foxes who had dens, and he didn't, and birds have what? Ness, he didn't even have that. So what was he? He was beneath everything. He put himself down at the bottom rung so that he could experience everything pertaining to the human existence. And so he took upon himself the form of a bond slave and was made in the likeness of what? Men. Now remember last time we taped, I kept emphasizing all the time, as I've already alluded to, without him becoming a man, could there have been salvation for the human race? No. Because the righteousness of God, starting way back in Genesis chapter 3, demanded a sacrificial death with the shedding of blood. And could a spirit do that? Do spirits have blood? Now we're going to see that again when I get into the Holy Spirit le uh, lessons. No, spirit doesn't have blood. So he had to become a human being in order for blood to be... Now, I guess that just triggered another thought. I haven't done it for a long time. We can just interrupt. That's why I'm glad I run my own show. Nobody has to tell me what I can do and I can't do. <laughs> okay, we're going to go back and then we're going to look at some absolutes. So put all this on hold for a minute. Come back with me to Romans chapter 3. The very absolutes that every human being has to face if they want eternal life or salvation. They have to face them. They have to deal with it. And I want you to be aware of that today like never before. And this fits right in with what we're talking about. That Christ had to become human. He had to have blood. It had to be shed. All right, Romans 3, verse 23, what I call the first of three absolutes. I used to have two, but now I've put this one in as a third one. <clears throat> All got it? Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all, no one excluded, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. An absolute. You can't argue with that. You cannot detour around it. You can't tunnel under it. You can't fly over it. What do you have to do? You have to meet it head on. I have fallen short of the glory of God. It's an absolute. Nobody can be saved without understanding this. Nobody. All right, the next one. Go all the way back to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter... 9. And this is what made me think of this. See, I can prepare and prepare, Jerry, and I can prepare, and I didn't have these in my preparation. <laughs> but here it is. Verse 22 of Hebrews 9. Almost all things are by the law, purged with blood. But here's the part that I'm looking at. Without shedding of blood, there is what? No remission. None. The other word for remission is forgiveness. So without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness. And yet every human being is a sinner because we've fallen short. All right, now then when these preachers are forgetting about the atoning blood and they're feeding their congregations everything and anything but, 
do they stand a snowball's chance in being forgiven of anything? No. Because you have to have the blood. It's an absolute. And you're not going to compromise with God and say, well, now, wait a minute. Now, that's kind of a gory situation. Do I have to face something like that? Yeah, you bet you do. The cross wasn't pretty. Oh, we make necklaces now, you know. Oh, ours hasn't got one on. But anyway, we make necklaces. We have prettied the cross, haven't we? But was it? No, it wasn't pretty. It was awful. It was awful. Why? Because sin is awful. You know, I'll never forget. Do you remember, honey, when we were in the mosque, the Golden Dome, way, way back? One of the first or second times when we took a tour to Israel, and at that time, you know, the Intifada hadn't started, and we could actually, if we took off our shoes, we could go into the Golden Dome. And inside the dome in Rome, inside the dome on the bottom floor, is this huge rock that comes up about eight feet above the floor where supposedly Abraham offered Isaac. And so our Jewish guide was explaining how that the altar of Israel's temple was quite likely in this very same spot. And then he was explaining the geography of the area, how all this blood of these animals could just be drained down and then it would go out through underground caverns out to the Kidron Valley. So anyhow, we were talking about all the slaughter of all these animals and somebody in our group, we weren't that large, probably around 30 of us, somebody made comment that that was such a gruesome religion. Well, our little Jewish guide, of course, uh, tried to explain the fact that when these priests killed these animals, it was such an instantaneous death that the animal never suffered one iota. But anyway, the guide was trying to explain away the situation and take away the gruesomeness of it. And I'll never forget, I spoke up and I said, but Levi, that was his name. I said, Levi, don't try to take away the horrors of the shed blood of the cross. Because when they offered that lamb, many times it was probably like a household pet, to see that lamb shed its blood for their sin just tore them up. Why? Because that's what sin does. And so the whole idea of the sacrificial uh, system of worship and the shedding of all this blood was to show Israel the awfulness of their sin. But see, we've lost that. My goodness, today they don't even call sin sin anymore, do they? They've got all kinds of other politically correct terms for it. But hey, I'm old-fashioned enough, yet I still say sin is sin, and it stinks, beloved. Sin stinks in the nostrils of a holy God. But we've put all that aside. Well, we hadn't better, because we have to face the absolute that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And you can't argue it. You can polish it up all you want, and you're not going to get around it. All right, now the third one is just next page over, still in Hebrews, chap chapter 11. <clears throat> Attribute number three, or absolute rather. Absolute number three. Verse 6, Hebrews 11. But without faith, it is impossible, no way, shape, or form can you please God without faith. But faith in what? The gospel, the shed blood, the death, the burial, the resurrection. How many church congregations are hearing that anymore? Oh, I just had a guy call last night from one of our eastern cities. He said, Les, he said, my wife and I have been visiting churches one right after the other, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, since I'd been out there. And I was out there when? In April? Yeah. As we can't find a church that's preaching this. He said, we don't hear it. Not a one. 
Now, I don't know how many Sundays that would be, but whatever. And I know this is true because they don't like it. And then Sunday school, I have people who have been under my teaching, and when they bring out some of these things, yeah, i got heads nodding all over the place. What do they think? They think you've lost it. Where do you get that? Right here. And they can't see it. But anyway, those are your three absolutes. And now if you'll come back to Philippians, I don't know what in the world got me off on that. But anyway, here we have the fact that we have to believe. We have to know what God's Word says. See, a lot of faith today is in anything and everything but the gospel. Oh, faith in God, faith in the miracles, faith in this and faith in that. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about faith in the gospel, that work of the cross. Otherwise, Christ wouldn't have had to come and become flesh because it is paramount that that is the very center of our salvation experience. All right, back to Philippians chapter 2. Reading the last part of verse 7 where we left off, and so he took upon himself the form of a bond slave and was made in the likeness of men. He was totally human. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself of his own volition stood there and took all the abuse of the Romans and all the verbal abuse of the Pharisees and the priests and so forth without a word of opposition. Why? Because he was voluntarily becoming the Lamb of God. And a lamb, you know, never fights back. I guess that's why God chose that as the typical sacrificial animal. A lamb does not know how to fight back. And so as a lamb of God, see, he went without a word of argument. All right, and became obedient, just like Isaac of old. He became obedient unto death, not just death by a sword, not just death by maybe a beheading, but the worst death that the human race has ever invented the death of the cross because again you and I do not even have an inkling of the suffering and the horrors of death by crucifixion it just literally crushed the diaphragm so that they couldn't breathe and you see that's why they had the the block of wood under their feet then they could push their feet up once in a while and get a little bit of relief from the diaphragm and get a breath of air. And so it was an excruciating death. All right, and this is what is pointed out then in this last portion of the verse. It wasn't just death that he went through. It was the death of the cross. And again, nothing else could have consummated our salvation. He had to be lifted up. He had to shed his blood. He had to suffer because that was all part of the, the payment of sin. Not because God is so awful. It's because sin is so awful. And my, we're seeing it explode all around us. You know, uh, I take the Daily Oklahoman and every day, every day, it's murder, it's rape, it's drugs, it's alcohol, and it's just coming like a flood. So don't blame God. And so sin is awful. And in order to pay that sin debt, Christ had to meet all of the demands of a holy God. All right, on that basis, I'm going to take you back for a minute to Romans chapter 3 because I had a phone call yesterday that I had to use this verse. And uh, I think since I'm talking about how much the cross accomplished, Romans chapter 5. I had to look for a minute. Romans chapter 5.
Oh my, I think we got time. Let's just jump all the way up to verse 17. Romans 5, verse 17. Now remember what we just saw in Philippians, how that Jesus Christ took upon himself the form of a man that he might suffer death, not just death as may usually happen, but even the death of the cross. All right, Romans chapter 5, verse 17, honey. For if by one man's offense, Adam, who plunged the human race into where we are, if by one man's offense, death, and death and sin, remember, are synonymous, reigned by one, much more they who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, the second Adam, and who is that? Jesus Christ. See that? Now then, verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, Adam, judgment came, the curse, upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men. Everyone has had an opportunity. If they don't take it, it's not God's fault. They've all had the opportunity. So the free gift came upon all men under justification. Now this is all repetition to make the point. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. In other words, the whole human race fell under the curse. So by the obedience of one, obedient to what? The death of the cross. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous by faith. Now 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense, in other words, that sin could be seen for what it really was. It was written in stone, so there was no arguing out of it, that the offense might abound. Now here's where it is. But where sin abounded, the worst the most awful that you can think of. What's greater? What's greater? The rest of the verse. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What a God! That no matter how vile a man may become, or what an awful sinner he is, God's grace is greater than his sin. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-800. 369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.